Hello friends, uh, today we're going to discuss about vaporizers. My name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh and uh, I'm a consultant in anesthesia working in Liverpool, UK. I know you must be wondering what this small child is doing with water. Yeah, of course he's playing with water and this has got nothing to do with vaporizers. No, I just wanted to talk about his water. <clears throat> you know, when you see a pool of water, and now it depends whether it has actually rained during winter or it's rained during summertime. The water during winter will stay longer on the roads, whereas in summer it will evaporate very quickly. So it is all to do with temperatures, right? And we'll see what uh, this is uh, in related uh, to vaporizers. Now, the all our anesthetic uh, agents, the uh, volatile anesthetic agents are in liquid form and they need to actually be changed into gaseous form uh, or vapors and uh, for the anesthesia purposes. So liquids basically have molecules uh, which, uh, you know, they are attracted, they have a cohesive force between them and uh, that what makes it a liquid. But at the surface, uh, molecules can actually leave and come back into the into these you know, so it can move from one state to another uh, state and uh, when they are actually uh, within a closed container and uh, these molecules uh, hit uh, the wall of the container and they create a pressure and, and this is uh, what the vapor pressure is so if it is left open evaporation happens right so it goes into the atmosphere. A few molecules might hit the side of the wall and actually come back uh, into back into the liquid form, uh, but most will escape into the atmosphere. But within the closed container, they create a kind of pressure uh, within the uh, system, and this is the wave vapor pressure. And the vapor pressure obviously will depend on the uh, how volatile the liquid is. More. Um, Volatile the liquid, the greater the vapor pressure at that particular temperature. And uh, you can actually create, uh, uh, you know, uh, the liquid uh, into vapor uh, by providing heat, right? So, unlike in the water which is left on the, uh, you know, the roads, if you actually heat it up, if you heat water up, then you can actually convert into a gaseous form uh, much more readily and that's what is uh, boiling is about so if you look at the graph between temperature and the pressure as the temperature rises the uh, pressure increases right and the pressure at which it equals the atmospheric pressure, that is 760 of, of uh, millimeters of mercury, that is your boiling uh, temperature. So if you look at water, uh, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. At this, the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, the 760 of millimeters of mercury. That is obviously at uh, sea level. So. If you go on the mountains, uh, it will boil at a lower pressure. Uh, so it will boil because the uh, pressure, the atmospheric pressure that will be lower. So say, for example, if it has at 400 millimeters mercury pressure, and then it will boil at around 80, 82 degrees uh, Celsius. So that they tend to boil at lower temperature as the height increases or vapor pressure decreases. Now, if we look at the older vaporizers, this is the called the Schimmelbusch mask. And uh, on the uh, left side, you can actually see there's an ether bottle and uh, there's uh, a gauze pieces over it. So what uh, was done is that this was placed on the patient's mask and they would keep dropping the ether uh, through the bottle <coughs> and it will evaporate. So obviously, this was not an accurate method of uh, delivering a uh, volatile anesthetic agent. But then ether is so, uh, I mean, less, it is least potent of all the anesthetic agents, then uh, chances of actually uh, giving an uh, overdose of volatile anesthetic uh, it was very minimal. So it would work with a very low, but it can't work with a very uh, newer agents which are highly potent. 
So the other vaporizers like uh, the Boyle's Bottle and the Goldman Vaporizer and these were used for uh, yeah, also used uh, for delivering anesthesia. Again these are not as uh, accurate uh, to deliver the anesthetic concentration as our newer uh, vaporizers. Now uh, you see this guy with the uh, pot and uh, uh, you can actually uh, see that there is uh, some uh, jute uh, you know, bag surrounding this. And uh, you must be again thinking, what does this goes to vaporizers? Uh, this is to just show that uh, the way the earthen pots cool the uh, water is that the evaporation occurs from the surface of the pot. So as the evaporation occurs, the temperature actually of the water drops. And that's why you get a cold water in this pot. Same thing is this is this is the air cooler and in the air cooler the water is getting evaporated as the water evaporates it drops the temperature of the air uh, surrounding it. So these principles are used in, in vaporizers. Uh, I'm not saying that they, the evaporation uh, will improve the uh, accuracy but I'm saying that it will reduce the accuracy because the evaporation reduces the vapor pressure will likely drop within the uh, chambers of the vaporizers. So you can see that this is a halothane vaporizer, hardly seen nowadays uh, in our setup. And there are more modern vaporizers like a Tech 5 vaporizers uh, for isoflurane. Uh, this is Tech 7 vaporizer for uh, coflurane. And then you can also see another vaporizer on the extreme. Uh, uh, left of the machine or rather the right side as I'm facing it and the blue one and that is the for the desflurane or that is a toxic vaporizer a lot more modern vaporizer and this is the only one which requires electricity to deliver the anesthetic vapors so if you look at the tech vaporizers tech vaporizers are known as the plenum vaporizers uh, plenum basically means a pressurized chamber the method of regulating output concentration is by variable bypass. That means that the gases uh, pass uh, partly through the bypass chamber and partly through the vaporizing chamber, which I will discuss later on. A uh, method of vapor vaporization is by flow over of the, uh, you know, the gases over the liquid. And temperature compensation can be by flow alteration using bimetallic uh, strips or rod or bellows. And they're all agent specific. You've seen that there was a vaporizer for halothane, there was a vaporizer for isoflurane, and for coflurane. So there are very agent specific vaporizers. And these vaporizers, vaporizers are located outside the breathing systems. So there are also vaporizers known as the drawer vaporizers. Now, drawer vaporizers, these are the old types of, you can see the Oxford vaporizer and the EMO. Yeah. So EMO vaporizers, these are used in field anesthesia. They need to actually have very low resistance to flows. And this is how they look like. So they need to actually have a non-rebreathing valve uh, so that the gases do not flow back into the vaporizer and they are vented out. So once the patient breathes in, uh, the gases flow over the uh, liquid and the patient draws up the uh, you know, anesthetic agent. Um, it can, you can actually add oxygen as well. Uh, some can actually have bellows attached to it as well. There's, uh, so we had something called Oxford bellows uh, for uh, the EMO. So EMO with Oxford bellows were commonly used. The problem with these vaporizer is that, like I said, as the vaporization increases, uh, the uh, you will likely have drop in temperatures. So the accuracy is not as great also, uh, these need to actually have very low resistance to breathing. Otherwise, uh, you know, the, especially, is, uh, you know, you can have patients hyperventilating to almost 60 liters per minute. So when they actually have a greater uh, respiratory rate, then there might not be enough time for rapids to pass over the liquid uh, anesthetic agent and the patient may not be anesthetized. So there are 
you know, quite a few drawbacks to this drawer over vaporizers. So we have is what's called the flow vaporizers. And like what I was explaining before, as uh, the liquid vaporizers, so uh, part of the fresh gases, uh, you know, these fresh gases flow uh, through the bypass chamber, other part flows through the vaporizing chamber. They pick up the vapors and they mix uh, with the bypass, uh, uh, you know, gases coming through the bypass. So as they vaporize, the temperature of the liquid will actually come down. So it will drop. And uh, this is a graph showing how it happens with time. So as time happens slowly, the uh, anesthetic, the temperature of the anesthetic gases liquid part will actually drop. And so will be the output from the vaporizing chamber. So which is not very good. So this will reduce the accuracy of the vaporizers. So to do this, one thing you need is the heat sink. So if you look at the vaporizers, they are made of, of metals, okay, which can hold the heat from the atmosphere. So as the liquid temperature drops, it can draw heat from the atmosphere. That is the heat sink. So if you lift a vaporizer, any of the tech vaporizers, see they're really, really heavy. And that's because of the metal that is used as a heat sink. You can also have supplied heat, uh, which is not used in, uh, in the uh, most of tech vaporizers, except for desflurin. And I will actually talk about it. So that's the easier way of doing that you uh, just supply the heat to increase the vaporization as the temperature drops. The, some of the old type, the measured flow vaporizers, uh, used a, a kind of sieve through which the anesthetic gases would pass through and this will cause bubbling and because the bubbling increases the surface area, you can increase the amount of the volatile anesthetic agent in the vapor form. So that was one method. Uh, these are copper, something called copper kettle vaporizers and uh, again, uh, we don't use them now. <coughs> The other way is to actually increase the surface area of the, uh, uh, you know, which uh, the liquid anesthetic can be there or increase the time over which the vaporizing vapor, the gases, the, the gases which are passing through vaporizing chamber actually have more time to pick up the gas. This is called baffles. So these are uh, baffles you'll find uh, in the newer uh, machines. Now, if you look at the Boyle's bottle, they used to actually have a plunger and now there were no compensating devices. See, it was a glass bottle. Glass is a very uh, poor conductor of heat and uh, hence uh, the temperature would drop. And so what one thing had, it had a call. So when you had the, you push the plunger down, uh, it would cause bubbling. So this was actually used in a uh, older vaporizers. Uh, so this is a good thing. Now the other temperature compensating devices. So <clears throat> if you need to actually increase the, uh, uh, you know, concentration or uh, you want a constant uh, concentration to be delivered by the vaporizer, as the flow uh, increases and uh, the consumption uh, of the water anesthetic increases, the temperature will drop and uh, the you know, the sink and the baffles and the surface area may not be able to compensate. So what uh, the temperature compensating device will do is that they will increase the resistance in the bypass chamber and reduce the, the resistance in the vaporizing chamber so that more gases can flow through the vaporizing chamber and pick up more volt anesthetic agent and mix with the bypass chamber. So these can be in type of the bimetallic strips so there are two metals uh, with different expansion and contraction coefficients or they could be bellows filled with a liquid which contracts and expands or this could be bimetallic rods in which you have one rod inside the other with different expansion coefficients so this this is actually uh, showing uh, how the uh, a bimetallic strip actually works so as the uh, temperature starts dropping down uh, uh, with the uh, you know evaporation uh, process the bimetallic strip will bend and it will actually increase the resistance so 
it will actually move and try to actually close that wall. So the resistance in the bypass chamber increases and more uh, agent, actually the uh, gases, the fresh gases flow uh, more into the vaporizing chamber. Uh, so the output then, the output is actually maintained, constant output is maintained. So this is looking at this, what happens uh, with the vapor concentration. So the you have the, uh, uh, you know, splitting is, is actually increased. So there is only 60% going through bypass, 40% now going uh, through the vaporizing chamber. Initially it was 80 and 20. So the splitting ratio is changed by the bimetallic strip. There are some vaporizers and, um, and in which they're like injection system they're called. And uh, these, um, the reason why I'm mentioning it is because of the toxic vaporizer. Some people actually wrongly call it uh, a, a injection system. It's not an injection system uh, because we will discuss the toxic vaporizer in a lot more details. And so this this is a, a uh, you know a injector vaporizer uh, wherein uh, the anesthetic agent is injected into the your uh, the bypass chamber. So uh, the other things uh, which are there uh, to increase the volatile agent is, is like I said, is the, uh, you can see uh, there is these gauze pieces which increases surface area. These are dipping into the liquid. Um, there's bimetallic strip, there's baffles within that. There's bim there, that is the, your bimetallic strip there. And this is the concentration dial. Uh, Okay, and uh, this one is showing the bimetallic rod, so that uh, increase or decreases the resistance within the system. And you can see the inlet uh, is torturous. This is for preventing the back pressure effect. And there are also check valves uh, within uh, your back bar. Again, these are for preventing the uh, uh, back pressure. So these are known as pressure compensation. Uh, so torturous inlet, uh, check valves, uh, small vaporizing uh, chambers, these are all for pressure compensation, so there's no back pressure effect. Uh, back pressure effect can actually cause increase in the output. So when uh, the gases, when you increase the, uh, uh, you know, the back pressure, the gases are compressed within the vaporizing chamber, so in the next breath, there'll be more anesthetic agent delivered, so this has to be prevented. So these are some of the methods for pressure compensation. So looking at the uh, Tech-Sig vaporizer, it's slightly different from the other vaporizer here. They are heated vaporizers and there are actually two, two chambers. So this is this is what is to do with the uh, flow dependence. So in in the uh, Tech vaporizers, that is Tech 5, Tech uh, 7, TAC 4, TAC 3, there is flow dependence. As the flow increases, the temperature will drop and all the compensating devices may not be able to actually compensate for the drop in temperature with increasing flow. But saying that, most vaporizers are pretty accurate over the flows used in anesthesia practice. Uh, so the toxic vaporizer, um, the say why this is actually got a very low boiling point. The bo uh, boiling uh, uh, point is only 23 degrees for uh, desfluorine, whereas it is 48 and 58 degrees for ISO and CO. So why is that we need to actually uh, heat up a agent which is easily, you know, able to vaporize, is to evaporate very easily. Um, is highly volatile. Why Why you need to heat up a highly volatile, whereas we don't actually have to heat up a, you know, agent which is uh, not, you know, as volatile. Uh, it makes no sense, but the answer actually lies in the fact that the desfluorine is, is less potent than isofluorine and sevoflurane. And this we will see uh, with these diagrams, okay. So the, if you look at the uh, sevoflurane and the, uh, you know, the ambient temperature in operation theater is around 18 to 20 degrees. Uh, so all of them are calibrated at that point. 
So uh, at 20 degrees, the sealed fluorine has a saturated pressure of 170. And uh, the isofluorine has a vapor pressure 240 and it is 669 for desfluorine. So very high saturated vapor pressure uh, with desfluorine. Now if you look at the boiling points uh, for the uh, uh, you know various agents, it will be 23 degrees here. So at 23 degrees Celsius, uh, the vapor pressure uh, of the chamber inside a, a desfluorine uh, will be equal to atmospheric pressure. That means it will start boiling at around 23 degrees. Whereas uh, for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, isofluorine, uh, the temperature boiling is, is 48 degrees. Okay, at 48 degrees, if you raise the temperature, it'll start boiling, that's uh, okay. And whereas for the sealfluorine, it is 58 degrees. So those are the boiling points. For that but we don't actually uh, you know we're not working at those temperatures we work at 18 20 degrees celsius now like i said uh, with the uh, evaporation the temperature of the liquid uh, drops down and so if it drops down by uh, one or two degrees you can see that the drop in the vapor pressure of sphereflurane and isofluorine is actually very minor is moneyed. Now this drop in saturated vapor pressure can be compensated by the splitting ratio, change in splitting ratio. It can be, I mean, by using the bimetallic strip or bimetallic rod. But if you look at one degree drop in the, uh, in a temperature for desferrin, the drop is drastic. Now all those uh, mechanisms which are increasing, you know, the uh, the metal sink uh, increasing the baffles and this, these will not be able to compensate. That means that the saturated vaporizer uh, in other tech vaporizer or the normal tech vaporizers with desfluorine cannot be maintained. The whole idea of a tech vaporizer that, that the liquid anesthetic agents okay within that the vapors are at are actually at saturated vapor pressure for that particular agent. So for desfluorine, it is pretty high uh, vapor pressure, which drops drastically with even one degree drop in temperature. With the uh, sulfurane, uh, it is easy to actually maintain that drop, and uh, and same thing with iso or enfluorine or halothane. So if you look at the MAC of sulfurane and uh, look at the MAC of isofluorine, one point one five or two. Now this is this is they are highly potent. You don't need to actually increase require a huge amount of these. But for desperate Mac is around five to six or six to seven percent. So you require a very uh, large amounts of desperate uh, to maintain the anesthesia. So the drop will be much greater uh, with sevoforane. Oh, sorry, with desperate than with sevoforane. So the there are two circuits uh, within the uh, desfluorin vaporizer, so the fresh gas flows uh, comes in through a different circuit and there is a separate circuit from the vaporizer. So this is like actually adding, uh, you know, so if you want to make a, uh, you know, a, a drink for yourself, uh, you can add water, okay, and it depends. If you increase the water, so you have a known amount of uh, the, your concentrate, if you increase more water, there'll be more dilution, right? Or you can actually say that it depends on the dilution. So if you want a larger amount, you will need to add larger amount of the concentrate to maintain the same taste, right? I hope you get this concept. So if you're actually having a small container or a small bottle, and with the same amount of concentrate, to have the same kind of taste, you need less water. Uh, with uh, the same concentrate and, uh, you know, and uh, a larger glass, if you add the same amount of water, you will have, uh, or greater water, you'll have diluted solution. So, in normal sense, you can actually see that, uh, we, you can see the water is, is like your fresh gas flows, and the concentrate is your and desfluorine. So as the as the uh, dilution actually increases, so if you increase the water, 
to maintain say you want a concentrate which has a say a two percent so you will likely have to increase the concentrate along with the increase in the water or the diluent so that's what this vaporizer actually does so what we have is uh, in the tech vaporizer it is heated up to two atmospheres so that at all the time there is the vapors are at at greatest more than the saturated vapor pressure we know that the saturated vapor pressure for uh, desferrin at 20 degrees is 669 and uh, so it uh, when you heat it up to 40 degrees uh, the pressure inside increased to almost two atmosphere so looking at this vaporizer so there are dual circuits so it is uh, it's uh, electrically heated uh, thermostatically controlled to 40 degrees and that is a constant temperature pressurized to two atmosphere and so there is a circuit uh, which carries the uh, your fresh gases and you have a circuit which carries the gases from the vaporizer so this is a dual circuit and this is linked by a electromechanical mechanical coupling so what it does it, it actually senses the pressure on both sides so when you increase the flow the pressure on the uh, your fresh gas flow circuit will increase and this will then be uh, you know uh, the signal is sent to a, a regulator which is inside the vaporizer which we don't see and this will make sure that the web output from the vaporizer is increased like i said a more water you need more concentrate to maintain that same concentration so when you actually decrease the flow so it will say no we need to actually reduce the output from the uh, you know vaporizer so it will reduce the output to maintain that constant yeah so this is actually a, a gas vapor blender where the gases are blended with the gas flows so for two percent for example if you actually want two percent and uh, your flows are actually only 100 mls. So you just need 2 mls. But if you really, if you increase the flows uh, to a liter, then you would need, need more more amount of there. You need 20 mls coming out uh, from the vaporizer. So this is a gas vapor blender. It, this is not an injector, like I was talking before. Injectors are totally different group of vaporizers. So with this, uh, we finish lecture on uh, the basis of uh, the uh, vaporizers. And uh, to summarize that, uh, what we try to actually explain here is that you need to know principles of vaporization. So as the liquid vaporize, they drop their temperature. So in vaporizers, when the liquid anesthetic agents are vaporizing, they drop temperature and these need to be compensated. As the flow increases, the amount, uh, if the output from vaporizer is not increased, that will dilute the gases, so you will drop the concentration. So you need to actually have a mechanisms uh, to maintain this constant, constant, uh, concentration, the constant concentration of the output. So this is done by the bimetallic strip. So it will increase the resistance in the bypass flow so that there is more flow through the vaporizing chamber the amount of vaporization is increased by you know increasing the surface area and uh, it is also there are baffles which allow the you know gases through the vaporizing chamber to uh, take more time to pick up the vapors uh, from the surface of the anesthetic agents this toxic vaporizer is an electrically heated vaporizer with dual circuit. It is heated uh, to a constant temperature of 40 degrees, 39 to 40 degrees, uh, which causes the gases to be uh, pressurized within the chamber to two atmosphere. And these two circuits are linked using electromechanical coupling uh, using a differential pressure transducer. And as we increase the flow, this transducer gives uh, a signal to the vaporizing chamber to increase the flow from there so that the output is constant. So this is a gas vapor blender and uh, it's electrically heated. So this is a different kind of vaporizer to our usual uh, tech vaporizers. Drawer vaporizers are not used uh, uh, in clinical practice, but they may be used in the field anesthesia. 
Uh, so the EMO appraiser along with X Oxford Bellows are probably still used in some uh, countries in the field anesthesia. Okay, thank you for listening to the lecture.